Welcome everyone to the, oh, I was going to say Bible reading, but I guess it's a Bible reading, yeah, tonight. Um, before we get going, we'll speak to the Lord once again in prayer. Uh, dear God and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time we can open your word. We're thankful for um, the truth that is we can find within it, um, theological truth and practical truth for our lives, great things that our Lord has done. And Father, we're thankful that we have the freedom to read of these um, different occurrences in your uh, son's life, and we pray that you might help us to apply lessons that we can read uh, in Mark 5 to ourselves uh, and can come away from this uh, look into your word with a greater appreciation and uh, worship for your son and a, a greater uh, worship and knowledge of you. We just ask for your blessing on this night and in the name, amen. All right, so we want to welcome to Mark 5. Mark chapter 5. And when they had come to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met them out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even the chains, because he had often uh, been bound with shackles and chains, and chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke into pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself. Sorry, just a moment. Am I reading from Mark? I printed something off, but I think I might have grabbed the wrong one. Can anybody tell me? Okay, okay, I was very confused, because I have ESV and my Bible, and I have New King James on my notes, so sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, and when they had saw Jesus, verse 6, when they had saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly, that he uh, would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains, and so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission, and then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, for there were about 2,000 in the herd. And then the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened, and how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And then, and when he got into the boat, he, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he, might be, that he might be with him and go with him. However, Jesus did not permit him. But said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And now he has had compassion on you, and he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and marveled. Verse 21, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. And he was by the sea, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he had saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians, she had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came, from, came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if only I had may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. I Immediately the fountain of her blood dried up, and she felt within her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself the power had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who it was who had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. 
While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, John the brother of James. And then he came to the house where the ruler of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, or a crowd, that, that those who had wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose, walked, and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and that something should be given her to eat. Sorry about that at the beginning. When you're looking at different passages being read uh, from uh, multiple writers, you can get confused, and then especially if you bring up uh, the wrong Bible. Not the wrong Bible. There's no wrong Bible. Uh, There's some wrong paraphrases. Um, But anyway, so um, we'll start at uh, verse 1, talking about the demon-possessed man, the demoniac of the Gerasenes, or uh, Gadara. Um, And just a personal note is I think, not just because I was assigned this, I honestly think it's one of the more interesting miracles that happens in our Lord's life, and that's recorded in Scripture. Um, Nothing like this and this display over spiritual darkness, um, commanding of spiritual darkness, nothing has been seen like this since uh, when God threw Satan and his angels out of heaven. And nothing will be seen like it until the end of the tribulation, when Satan and his demons will be bound for a thousand years and then eventually cast into hell in the lake of fire. So it's a very unique and a, kind of a strange narrative. I always thought it was kind of strange growing up. Um, it was it definitely stood out to you. It wasn't just like uh, any, it's interesting to say, any of the other casting out of demons, but this one definitely uh, struck me as uh, one of the most important ones, I feel, um, that we can read of. And it's important, I think, because it's one of the main, major parts of Scripture that proves Christ's deity. And in order to prove Christ's deity, we saw in the chapter before, he had to have cre- command and control over creation. Um, and in order for us to even have any hope that there's a kingdom coming, if we're going to believe Jesus, that there's a kingdom coming without sin and that we will be reborn into new bodies, well, on this earth, he needed to prove that he could cast and come out and command uh, away evil. Um, We know from Genesis 3 and prophesying that the Messiah uh, will be the one who crushes the serpent's head. And he will have commanding, and with this, we can assume he's commanding power over Satan and his hosts. Uh, So, and I think this is one of uh, the Lord's main, one of his main purposes in coming. Um, We like to think that Jesus came, obviously, for the cross, in which he uh, destroyed death and sin and hell, and his resurrection as well. We think he came to heal But he also came to uh, display his power and to uh, throw out what Satan had been working on. Um, In 1 John 3, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In the story, we see that in this section, we see Jesus' commanding power over what the Legion calls himself as uh, what the man to possess by demons is called as legion, which legion is a military term at that time, the Roman term, um, for about four to 6,000 men. We know there was about 2,000 as 2,000 entered, uh, well, at least 2,000 would have entered the whole herd, because you know that the whole herd had destroyed, been destroyed. And a big question, especially at this time, we can even see in the previous chapter, is that the disciples were still kind of Though they believed in Christ, they were still kind of a bit confused on who he was, right? Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And we still see that all the way through um, some of these uh, uh, early narratives with Christ, even the disciples can be a little confused again. Who is this? Who is this? Because they were expecting, you have to understand that even the disciples at times were expecting that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom now. But ultimately, we can see from this is he wasn't there to destroy the Romans. He was there 
to show his power over sin and show his power over the kingdom of darkness. Um, and ultimately, what's the purpose of this kind of strange story? Well, everything can be brought back to John 20 and 31, but you know, these things are written to you that you might believe, and Jesus uh, is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you might have life in his name. So um, just a little bit of a porch there, but uh, kind of back to our story. Um, so kind of geographically speaking, when they come across the lake, it, uh, we can read in uh, the Gerasenes of the Gadarenes or Gadara, um, and just so you know, um, there were a few different major cities in the area. The, major, uh, the largest city was Gadara. It was kind of the region. It'd be like saying you were from Detroit even if you lived in Canton. So the local area was most like the Garrison, uh, and the larger area was Gadara. And it says, as they got out of the boat, immediately, as we've been seeing through different chapters uh, throughout Mark, um, heavily, inf- uh, we believe, influenced by Peter, this immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met them. Matthew actually mentions that there were two um, men with unclean spirits, uh, but Mark just leaves it at one. Uh, It says that he was living among the tombs. Um, You think in our modern culture, when we think of someone who's who's living under the tombs, maybe our minds go to uh, pretty dark Halloween type stuff. A haunted person, a haunted monster that lives in a cemetery. But this is what the man did. He lived among the tombs. Um, we can see he was most likely, uh, based on the description of him, like some sort of, some sort of a ma- madman, a maniac. Um, some might describe him as a sociopath. We know definitely uh, that he was violent. Uh, Luke actually mentions that he wasn't wearing any clothes. Um, and I will say that some commenters note that potentially that um, note of his nakedness uh, was maybe a mark of his sexual wickedness as well. Um, so this man was uh, quite far gone from um, caring about his shame and about the way that he was living. Obviously he was possessed, but still this is the depths he had gone. Um, it also discusses his supernatural strength. Um, they tried to bind him, they tried to chain his hands and feet, um, and he would just retch out of them, and then the demons would drive him back out into the wilderness. Um, and it says in Matthew that, I know I'm referencing outside of Mark, but there's a few accounts of the story that bring up more uh, information. It says in Matthew, he was so violent that no one would pass that way. So in verse 5, it says, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Night and day, he was screaming. So not only is this poor man, this wretched, poor soul, completely controlled by thousands of demons, not only is he terrorizing the local community, he himself is a victim of torture by these demons. Uh, he, I don't think there was any benefit he got out of it. Um, he, he, he was trying to end everything by cutting himself, and which I can only assume is an attempt at his own life, you know, because he was constantly being tortured. He's crying out. He's, it says night and day he was crying out, so he probably didn't have a lot of sleep. Um, he just had, there was nothing within him that he could find any relief whatsoever. And then we find in verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshipped him. Now, I don't have an answer for this, um, but obviously in the spiritual realm, there is some way, there's some way that the these demons within him saw Jesus from afar and they could tell who he was. Um, we don't know how, we're not told... We're not really told why, but they were able to recognize him of some sort. And he says, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And so the one who is untamable, unsubduable, the one who completely has uh, gone out of control, the one who would rip from his chains and the one who had no rest, we see now when confronted with Christ, it says that in Luke, that he ran and he fell down before Jesus. You know, um, and then we see that they admit who Jesus Christ really was, the Son of the Most High God. And we see this repeatedly throughout Scripture, that the demons are quite well aware of who Jesus is. And they will be the ones at the beginning who will tell the truth of who Jesus is, but the Lord wants nothing to do with their testimony. 
Um, probably for practical reasons. You wouldn't want the demon-possessed man living in the hills crying out, um, being the one who proclaims your name to everyone. Um, but we will see that once he is uh, healed and saved, that, that is the opposite. But we see, especially in Mark 1, we see the same thing happening where Jesus doesn't want the testimony of the demons. Um, he, he would, um, because I think it could have led, just as we can read in other places, it would lead maybe Pharisees to truly believe um, not only just within their own heart they didn't want to believe, but it maybe could have led, like we saw, them believing he was of a certain demon or someone who would uh, serve one of them. Um, but what's very interesting, and I can't take credit for this area, uh, this connection that was made, is um, it says in... Um, it says in one of the uh, accounts that it says, do not torment me before the time. And so um, this question keeps coming up of not just before the time, we'll get to that, but this, this idea comes up that they are honestly afraid of what Jesus can do to them. Um, and you'd think that if you were terrified of someone who could torment you for eternity, the last thing you would do is run to them and fall at their feet. Um, but obviously there is something that we don't quite understand that would compel a fallen angel that there is no other option besides worship to their true one and only God. Um, in Mark 1 and 24, we have a similar thing that's told, uh, we have a similar line from the man in the synagogue with the unclean spirit saying, Let us alone. What have you to do? What have we to do with you, Jesus, Naz Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? So it seems odd that they ask all the time that they're afraid of Christ destroying them or tormenting them, but it's not that odd if we know from scripture that um, it's uh, the, at the end times will not is not the only time that a demon or, or a, a fallen angel has been put into the pit. Uh, it is an eternal bondage of some sort for uh, these creatures. Um, like I said, it's quite a strange topic when you start looking into it all. But um, the idea that um, they are afraid of what Jesus can do to them, but they're also compelled by who He is to obey His every word. Um, and so with that topic, uh, it seems that, and here's the um, connection I did not make, I found online, was that with this idea that in Matthew 8 and 29, have you come to torment us before the time, that demons are quite well aware, it seems, of the timeline of God. I mean, what else could they mean by saying before the time? Um, so it seems that they're quite aware that, well, this is Jesus' first coming, you don't cast us into the pit until the second coming. Why? What are you coming to deal with us for? And so they would beg him that they would not go out. And Luke, Luke it says that they begged them to not be sent into the abyss. And so then they asked Jesus, let us go into the pigs. And for animal rights activists, this is a, not a very nice um, thing to read, that the Lord would allow these demons to just take control of uh, these animals and ultimately destroyed them. And so I asked the question that, you know, what is the purpose of the Lord allowing 2,000 so pigs to be just destroyed by these demons? And I would pose it maybe um, that it could just be a power, it could just be a show of his power to command such a force of darkness. But I would also like to think it's used later here to question the people of the city. It's used to question them that what is more important to you, your 2,000 pigs, or this man you could not subdue, this man that you could not, that you tried your best to chain and to control. This man's in his right mind, but you lost your pigs. What's more important to you? Because we can see that the demons would plead with Jesus to not, not be sent away. Right? They understood his power. They understood who he was. But the people of the city, they pleaded with Jesus at the end to leave their area to leave the region. And so um, when the people come, they find the man clothed and in his right mind. Obviously, this took some time. The herdsmen had to go and tell the city. They said they told parts of the country. So there was obviously some time that we're not told of, a com of just time that Jesus spent with this man. He goes from suddenly not clothed to clothed, sitting in his right mind, at rest, at peace, finally. And we don't know how many years. But finally, once they get there, they plead with him to leave. And then we read of this man, 
now that he has his demons cast out of him, he wants to go with Jesus. He wants to go with Jesus on the boat. But Jesus says, no, go home to your friends and tell everything that God had done for you and how he has shown mercy on you. Um, and I believe um, from a little bit of study looking online and from a few commentaries that this is the first time the Lord sends out a, a missionary. He actually sends the missionary out. He's a Gentile missionary now, and he's sent to Decapolis. And I have to admit it well that I did not make this connection. Um, I believe I saw it in uh, one of John MacArthur's saying that he was sent to Decapolis, which is a region of ten cities, which there he proclaimed all that Jesus had done for him. And then we find out in Mark 7 that when Jesus arrives to the region of Decapolis, that people were already bringing their sick to Jesus. So this man went from um, total total ruin, total lo a lost soul, completely controlled by sin, completely controlled by the devil, to now being a missionary, in which obviously was a successful missionary, because people end up bringing, it says there in uh, Mark 7 about the deaf and the mute man that Jesus heals in, uh, in the Decapolis. And they wouldn't have known about Jesus until this. So this man, I believe, um, along with those who had written it, that he was the missionary to them. And his story, his testimony was so compelling. It wasn't compelling enough to the people of Gerasenes, of, of, of the area that told Jesus to leave at the time, but it compelled others by seeing this man and hearing his testimony that they would come and meet Jesus eventually as he would come to their region again. And so then Jesus um, and the disciples sail back across the sea, and we are met with uh, Jairus coming up and falling down before his Jesus' feet and um, pleading with him to come and heal his daughter, who is at the point of death. But then, before we can get there, uh, the, uh, we're met with the woman who touches uh, Jesus' garments. And this woman is a perfect picture of what a sinner in salvation truly looks like. She was at her wit's end, and she recognized what was wrong with her. She tried everything that she could do to be better, and she was left worse. And uh, uh, another comment I can't take for, for almost uh, a little bit of humor put in here is that Luke, the physician, uh, leaves out that the doctors made her worse. Just He leaves that part out. just says, oh, hey, she couldn't be healed. Uh, but Mark makes it clear that she was left much worse. <laughs> so... Um, just a funny little thing that was in there. Uh, but So she believes that G what Jesus could do for her because she thought, if I only just touched his clothes, I will be healed. It wasn't a, oh, I might be healed. Because no doubt there was people in this crowd who were, as the disciples could say, like all this, this crowd is thronging around you. You know, he, Jesus was being touched right and left. He, he was... He was definitely not being left alone to walk peacefully along as the crowd surrounded him on the outside. He was being touched and bumped. But this woman says, if I only touch his clothes, I will be healed. I will be healed. And then she acted with that faith in belief towards Jesus' power because it says at the moment that she was healed, uh, at the moment that she touched, uh, the power came out of him. It was an immediate change. Because it says in verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed. Um, another point is that she was seeking actively, she was actively seeking after Jesus. You know, it wasn't so much an opportunity, I don't believe it was an opportunistic uh, chance for her to, oh, Jesus is coming, I heard about that guy, maybe, maybe I'll see what happens if I go over there, right? She was, um, Jesus was going with Jairus, so he had already start, started going another direction, and when she comes up behind, and then she comes up behind him. So she wasn't like a passing thing. She had to make her way through the crowd to get to him. Just as I would think Jairus was not opportunistic. He actively sought to get to Jesus and confront him head on and ask for help. Um, which I think is the key to, uh, not the key to salvation, but a great picture of what it takes for a sinner to ever come to Christ. It's not an opportunistic thing. It's a desperate thing. It's a sinner who is, it's a person who has absolutely no hope, recognizes there's no hope within themselves, and actively getting, and actively uh, reaching out to Jesus. Um, 
Yeah, they were both seeking Jesus and they believed in his healing power. And we see throughout all the New Testament that there's many different times that it's not one way, and especially when we have testimony meetings, we can see that there's not just one way that the Lord speaks to people, that the Lord reaches people. It comes to the ultimate same conclusion that they recognize their sin and their helplessness, but we know throughout Scripture there was the blind man who cried out for Jesus. He couldn't, he didn't know what was going on. We have Jairus who confronted Jesus, Nicodemus who met him at night, and Zacchaeus who climbed a tree. It doesn't matter how you got to Jesus. The fact is they were actively looking for him. And so a thought tonight for those who are not saved in the meeting, you will never be saved unless you are actively in desperate need and looking for the Lord and his salvation. So the question was, I always thought growing up was, was she kind of too proud for just coming up and trying to grab the, was she a little afraid, but you know, looking into a bit more about this disease she had, I won't go into too many details. Um, the reality is, according to Jewish law, she was completely unclean. It was unacceptable for even her to even be in that crowd. No doubt if somebody had noticed her from the crowd, they probably would have had a, a, a huge issue with it. Um, but So she was being as discreet as possible, but it wasn't because she was too proud of her condition, because when the Lord then eventually, uh, when she touches and she's immediately healed, she's filled with fear, and when the, and then Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And she had a moment, she didn't have to fall down and, and say it was me and tell her everything that was wrong, but she did come forward. Um, so it wasn't out of a matter of pride, I don't think, that she came up. I think it was a matter of she was considered unclean by society, and she was most likely just trying to be discreet because she was currently breaking law by even being that close and even touching someone with her condition. Just wasn't trying to bring attention to herself. And it says that at once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, who touched me? And so here's a question I always had growing up. Was this one of those moments that we read of our Lord pretending in hopes that that person will come forward? Or did he honestly not know? It wouldn't be um, the first time that our Lord, and I use the word pretend, um, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it wouldn't be the first time the Lord pretended to not know something. Um, there's a few, uh, a, list, a few lists of things I thought of and then things I found online of what the Lord pretended to know. Uh, for starters, he, he told his disciples to give the 5,000 something to eat. Clearly he knew there was no chance that they could do that. He deliberately did not make it to Lazarus in time. Um, he knew that Jesus would betray him, though he pretended he didn't in front of everyone else. And then this one I thought was good that um, I found in a commentary that on the road to Emmaus, he pretended as if he was going to go on. But then the two invited him in. Or it could be that Jesus honestly didn't know. In verse 32, it says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Um, we know there's definitely things that the Lord chooses um, to not know. He doesn't know the time and the hour in which he will return. And so maybe this was one of those uh, situations where he honestly did not know. Um, even as, but his disciples could say, look at the crowd. Like, how could you ask that somebody, like, obviously everyone's, everyone's touching you. What are you talking about? Um, but he, um, but I think there might have been, if it was on purpose and he was pretending, I think there's two things that stand out to us that why he would have asked the question to begin with. To answer the disciples' question, what are you talking about? Uh, I think it was she was clearly frightened because it says she was filled with fear when immediately she was healed. And ultimately, we want her to get to that point in which Jesus could tell her to go in peace, to have peace about what happened to her, an explanation for what happened to her, and not just be here uh, in terror. But ultimately, it brings the most glory to God uh, with her coming forward uh, and her telling the whole truth about what happened to her, not just, oh, it was me who touched you. Um, but the most glory comes to God when maybe the people of the day, knowing her, knowing what had happened to her, when they see um, when she comes forward and shows and talks about the issue that she had. So then it says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, and the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Uh, why bother the teacher anymore? And so just a little, uh, little look in here, um, kind of like a side, a side point, not only really a point, a side kind of live look into 
what I call Jairus' emotions. Um, first, he comes in a panic, and pleading with Jesus to come with him and lay his hands on his daughter. And then Jesus is delayed and held up with this woman. And then now he hears that his daughter is dead. You know, I, I think looking at the timeline, by the time Jairus would have asked for help, it's servants were probably already on their way. Uh, but what a roller coaster of emotions for sure. Um, to think that, all right, I, I'm going I'm to get the G- Jesus, I'm going to get the Lord, he's going to touch her, and everything's going to be good, and then you think that all is lost. But overhearing it in verse 36, what they said, Jesus told them, do not be afraid, just believe. So Jesus just reassures him, just affirms him, that same faith you had to me that I could touch her, keep continue it, believe it, don't stop, trust me. That's what he's saying. Um, when he came uh, to the home of the synagogue leader, so obviously he kept going, so Jairus believed him. When he came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. So uh, looking into the culture of the day, it was considered uh, when a person died, you were to pay uh, different people to come and not fake cry, but fake cry for someone they didn't know, just to make a scene, to show what a, a sorrow was filling the home. Um, and I believe I read somewhere that uh, even if you were very poor, you were still required by law to have at least one or two to come. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was for. but um, And so back to uh, Jairus' emotions. He comes to Jesus in panic, then he's filled with hopeless dread, and now he's dealing with the mocking of the people when Jesus says she's just sleeping. Um, and I think it shows uh, a true test of faith that these three different little stages of um, the afternoon with Jairus is he comes in maybe a panic but a hope, and then he's given this dread that, oh, maybe it's all gone, and now he has to deal with being ridiculed. But obviously that does not sway him from allowing Jesus into the home to raise his daughter. He believed. He believed in fear, and he believed in public ridicule. So Jesus puts everyone out. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, um, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Uh, and immediately the girl stood up and began to walk. And I'm sorry, I, I, maybe it's an obvious one to someone else, but the, uh, the need for saying that she was of 12 years of age and the woman having the 12 years of uh, her issue, I'm sure there's a correlation. I'm not, quite, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I did spend a little too much time in my study in the first part, um, but maybe if you know, come tell me after. I'd be interested to know. Um, he gave strict orders not to tell anyone. Uh, verse 43, he gave strict orders not to tell anyone uh, anyone to know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So my time is gone. I'm sorry if I rushed a bit, but if I could just looking over the entire chapter, um, I would say if I could describe it, it would be Jesus's. Um, it would be Jesus's power to restore those. Um, sorry, chapter shows is power to restore life to people who have no hope, absolutely no hope. Um, within the man who was demon-possessed, no hope. The woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years and there was n- nothing left and she'd spent all she had, even if they had found a solution, she wouldn't have afforded it, no hope. And then to Jairus being told his daughter was dead, he had no hope. So, um, actually, I'd like to uh, finish by reading Ephesians 2. Uh, in the first part, it says, And you he made alive, Ephesians 2 and 2, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom among whom also we were once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of our mind, and we are by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in his rich mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, uh, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So um, just looking um, at these three different individuals in this, I was reminded by this in Ephesians 2 of what we were saved from and what we are saved to. And I guess we can leave it, if you wanted a practical note, of these great miracles of Jesus Christ. Think of your own life and the miracle of your own salvation, how the Lord has worked. And um, maybe we can uh, go out tonight um, 
having a word for each person who asks of us, give us so we can give an account, but not only what Jesus said to the man with, who had the demons and who he had, he had saved, to go and tell your friends, go and tell your family, go and tell your co-workers all the Lord has done for you and how he has shown you mercy. Let's thanks. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this opportunity we had to uh, read uh, these three different accounts of uh, your son uh, healing in miraculous ways, healing a one who is uh, completely controlled and tortured by demons, healing one who had no control of her uh, uh, her disease and her health, and, and even raising a child from the dead. Father, we're thankful as uh, redeemed sinners that we can look at maybe each of these and see a bit of ourselves that we were um, tortured and we were held captive and we were dead in our sins and we had no hope. And Father, we're thankful that your son would go to that cross and he would uh, vanquish death. He would destroy the, uh, um, hell and he would destroy sin, giving us an opportunity uh, to have a future with you um, uh, in heaven. Just give thanks for the, this night and for your word. Uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, amen.